Welcome to the Student of the Game Podcast, where we break down the life, strategy, and advice of successful individuals who are students of their own game and masters of their own craft. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get to the episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Student of the Game podcast. I'm Tim Stone, and today we've got our special guest, Mr. Chris Petty. Chris, thank you for being here. Excited to dive into your story and uh, share with everybody. Yeah, Tim. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you bringing me on. Yeah, so we met in New Orleans at BPCon, which I, I, I think a couple people we've interviewed is the same story, but let's just uh, it had, dive into what do you do? You do real estate, but you got a pretty cool story. So let's just take it back to the start. Yeah, absolutely. So I graduated college in 2018 from the University of Georgia. And uh, after college, did two years of college ministry and started to move into a full time role um, where I was going to actually be moving across the state to a place that I wasn't very familiar with. And so it was Calhoun, Georgia, and starting a new comp, starting with a new company, a nine to five. And they gave me a little housing allowance. And so I didn't know anybody at the time and one figured it was the first, you know, opportunity I had to actually purchase a home. And so I started to um, just get, get some advice from people. And I heard of an idea called house hacking and, you know, a couple of um, some investor friends that I was just becoming friends with at the time shared with me, okay, you got to read this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And so this was a month before my move. Um, I was just, you know, kind of hearing these ideas of what investing was um, and started digging into a couple of the books and uh, heard of, um, you know, house hacking. So I was like, okay, how can I, you know, find a home within a month that I can move into? And that way I don't have to get into like a year lease contract on a rental and I can go ahead and, and start right now. And so, my very first property actually came through Airbnb. I um, was like, well, if, if there's going to be a vacant home that I can move into in 30 days, you know, Airbnb is a good start. So I went on there and started shooting out messages left and right. And I don't even know if they allow this anymore. Um, but back then, you know, you could message 50 hosts and there wasn't something that stopped you. And so um, was doing that. And this was right at the beginning of COVID. And so, I was able to find uh, one individual that just had his job go virtual for it in the foreseeable future. And so he was able to move back up north with his family and, and turned his house into an Airbnb. And it wasn't really a destination place. And so it wasn't going very well for him. And I came up, um, sent him a letter and told him I was interested in, in purchasing his property because I was looking for a home myself and it was a small three bedroom, two bath. He was all for it and um, actually let me go look at it the next day. And then we were able to do a contract virtually, never even met the guy before the house sold and sold it to me fully furnished. And then this was my first property, was able to get it um, under contract for $97,000, um, which in this small town was, you know, around, around the average for this size of the house. And this was two and a half years ago. And so was able to get that one landed at, you know, a decent price. And, you know, it was continuously reading on, you know, this house hacking, this everybody keeps talking about. And so um, my mortgage was coming up right at $600 a month. And so what I did was I found two other college students at the time up in Dalton, Georgia, that needed places to live and I invited them to come rent a room out for me. And each of those guys paid 400 each. <laughs> and so I was able to cover my mortgage and then a little bit extra that was able to go into my pocket. And so I was living, um, you know, with very minimal expenses at the time. And I said, like, Whoa, this real estate thing is, is pretty cool. I can, you know, buy a property, rent it out, make a little bit. And, you know, I was still, um, you know, really new to it. So I was like, what, what ideas or what, um, where can I, you know, get more of these ideas? And I started to deep dive into, um, books and came across bigger pockets. I know that's what we talked about, you know, you and I met and, um, I was just fully involved. I've 
wanted to go to, you know, all their conferences, listen to their podcast. I think Spotify came out last year that um, I listened to 72 podcasts and, and that's, you know, a podcast a week just from bigger pockets. And so um, was able to build a lot of knowledge in real estate through that. You know, at the time I wasn't, you know, just come out of college ministry, didn't have a lot of um, extra cash laying around. And so didn't have a clue on how I was going to get my second property, um, but knew that, you know, I was going to need to build this foundation of knowledge in order to do that. And so what I did was I started meeting with investors and, you know, finding people on Internet, LinkedIn, Facebook. I would just call small businesses and say, hey, you know, I, I'm a college student that just moved to town, you know, starting his career in Calhoun not knowing too many people, um, but looking to get, you know, some guidance and mentorship. Um, would you be interested in going and grabbing coffee for 10 or 15 minutes? And um, after probably 20 or 30 of those meetings, this guy, you know, shared with me at the end of our meeting and was like, you know, Chris, I have an investment property now I'm going through some tough times, just got a divorce and I'd be willing to own or finance it for you. And so, you know, what owner financing is, is instead of going to a bank to get the loan, they will actually take the mortgage in themselves and you pay them directly. And so I was able to negotiate with him to get a four unit apartment complex or also known as a quadplex with zero dollars down and then mm. take that and, um, you know, pay his monthly mortgage or monthly uh, what I owed him every month from the cash flow and then take that cash flow and reinvested it into um, the four units to make them more profitable and being able to raise the rents. Um, and, and once I noticed, you know, just how little the time, you know, five units. So the house that I lived in or, and then the four units um, was in maybe a four or five, five month span you know, it kind of lit me on fire and I was like, okay, this real estate thing is really something serious. And it's, it's not as, as hard as I thought it would be. Yeah. So, so the first deal you're just like messaging people on Airbnb, like that was your idea. Like, Hey, I'm just going to, um, find something quick that I know nobody's living at long-term right now. Um, like what, how many conversations did it take to get a deal? Like, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure you can't do that anymore. Like just message a bunch of people, but just for example. Yeah. So I remember um, typing up and just copy and pasting around 40 to 50 and, you know, 90% of the responses were no go away kind of responses. And then mm -hmm. I got a couple that were interested. Uh, they said, yeah, you know, we'd be interested in selling for the right price. And then they, would spit out a price and it would be something that I, you know, couldn't afford and wasn't pre-approved for. Um, and so, you know, out of 50 came that one and that's all I really needed. Um, and so, you know, I think normally the numbers are a lot higher, you know, when you're reaching out to people in that, that type of situation, you know, you may have to reach out to three or 400 people until you get that one. And so there was a little bit of luck involved. Um, but it definitely had some strategy too, because we were at the point of, the beginning of COVID, you know, Airbnbs, uh, people weren't traveling. They didn't know what was going on. And so they were having a downturn in their revenue and um, their occupancy rates. And so I was like, well, this would be a perfect time that someone has a vacant home that they can easily just get rid of it. Uh, I was willing to pay retail at the time just because this was my first property and I needed somewhere to live in, in 30 days. Mm -hmm. So then the second deal, the... 100% owner finance. Do you have to put any down payment down or no? No. So we um, were able to negotiate that to where um, I was paying the closing costs. So I did have a, around 5,000 that I was able to, um, you know, put down to make the deal close. And then mm -hmm. he was able to um, cover or give the, me the opportunity to have it, but not paying any of the equity. Um, until you know the second month until i collected you know four rent checks gotcha so um was this a property that he owned free and clear or did it have a mortgage what did that structure look like 
Yeah, so um, he owned it free and clear. He had had the property in, in his family for a long time. Um, and, you know, that's important with an owner finance deal. If someone doesn't own it free and clear and doesn't have a way to pay it off, you know, they still owe the bank. Um, you're going to be in a you know situation where they have to pay that off in order to owner finance it um, fully. And so luckily he had that paid off. Um, you know, and was going through a tough time getting ready to move the sit, move away from the city. And, you know, just saw, I guess, himself and, and me, you know, when he was, I guess, my age and, and was able to, you know, give me a fair price for it. It needed a lot of work. The tenants were, um, you know, on the rougher side, rents were low. And so he knew that it was going to be, you know, a big, big event for him to come in and, and make it market ready at the time. Um, it mm -hmm. wasn't the same market that it is, you know, right now. And so he would have had to invest a lot of time and money to get it market ready and was able to just, um, you know, <clears throat> not have to take a huge uh, capital gains tax on on the property if he sold it off upright then. And so since we were able to owner finance it, you know, he's if I was to pay, you know, the all 15 years and not, you know, buy him out of it, um, he would be able to get a little bit less of a tax gain on that. So that was another benefit of, for him. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. Like you were able to buy this apartment complex with no money or very little money. And also it was a winning situation for the seller because like he needed to get out of it. He wasn't going to be able to raise the rents and do the renovations. He didn't want to pay a bunch of money in taxes. And then also you didn't want to, you know, get all the financing and have a 25, 30% down payment. So it was like, it's pretty cool that you do that. Um, yeah. Well, where where did it go after that? Because I know you got into some more deals. Like, what is the the next step after you had five units? Yeah. So the the first thing that I did was started. Um, you know, at the time I was still working a nine to five. Started the const a construction business, and I was having. You know, when when I'd get off at five o'clock, I would go spend either four or five hours. Um, you know, working for somebody, one of our clients. And or either, you know, four or five hours and many late nights fixing up the quadplex. And, you know, my main strategy with the quadplex was to get it and kind of renovate it, get new tenants in there, raise the rents and then take it to the bank and say, hey, Mr. Banker, um, you know, I bought this for 175. What is it worth now? And in hopes of him um, appraising it a lot higher than I purchased it with and then writing me a check and taking the mortgage to a bank and that way i can take that check and buy more rental properties and so at the time i was um still focusing on renovating it but the refinance part hadn't happened yet so i had you know still very little money every dime i had was going straight into you know the quadplex fixing it up um and so but i was continually reading um listening to podcasts and you know, I was hearing about being able to bring in partners to deal. Sometimes if you can find a deal, the partner will put down the money and there's a lot of different ways that that can work out. And so um, I started to continue educating myself on how to find deals. You know, there's an analogy that I like to use. It's like you can build a one story home on a six inch foundation. But if you have that same six inch foundation and tried to build the Empire State Building, uh, it's going to crumble. And so you do need to have some type of um, foundation in order to, you know, feel comfortable and, and move forward, um, you know, investing. And that can be in anything, in any spectrum of investments or life. Um, and so was able to, you know, continuously learn on how to find deals, how to structure partnerships. And um, I started looking and then a couple months went by, found a trailer park up in Dalton, Georgia, it's eight acres. There was five trailers on it and a house. Um, kind of the same situation. The owner was, um, he actually inherited the property, so he didn't have any special ties to it. It was in rough shape, needed some work done. And he was willing to get rid of it. It was off market. Um, and so I was able to kind of talk him down to a price that I thought made it a grand slam deal. And we got it under contract. And so, you know, at that point, my head was spinning. I'm like, I don't, have any way of or shape form putting a down payment on this and, and purchasing it. So I have to go find a partner. 
And so, mm -hmm. you know, luckily I'd been meeting with a lot of investors, you know, over the past six months just to build relationships. And so I reached back to, you know, the investors that I've met with and then some future investors um, that I didn't even know at the time to see if they were interested in this deal and ended up finding an investor in Athens, Georgia, who um, was willing to put down and split the property 50, 50 because I had the deal under contract and brought it to him. He was going to put down my 10% and then allow me to pay that back with zero interest over a year and a half. And so mm -hmm. we were able to work that work out, you know, um, the contract work out the partnership of 50 50 split you know i wouldn't collect any cash flow until he's paid off you know the cash flow that we did have um you know my 50 percent of it went to him to pay off that 10 percent down on the property and we were able to pay him off in a year and a half and you know at that year and a half mark i started collecting cash flow and so you know just because that you don't have you know, the capital or the, the resources immediately or right in front of you um, isn't a reason why, you know, you can't get started investing. Yeah, absolutely. So what would you recommend to someone that's like, I have no idea. I wouldn't even think of that. Like, how do I find a deal? How do I get it under contract? Where do I find the paperwork? Like, where do I find investors? Like, to, to the person that's listening to this and they're like, I would have never thought of that. I would have just told the guy I don't have the money. Well, where would you recommend they start? Yeah. Well, if they're listening to this podcast, they're on a good trail. And so um, podcasts are great. Most everybody gets in the car at some point during the day, whether that's to go to the grocery store, um, you know, instead of just flipping on the radio or music, you can easily turn on and listen to 15, 20 minutes of a podcast or, if you do go on vacation or have a long trip, you can turn it on one, one and a half percent and you can crush, you know, four or five episodes of some type of learning investment podcast. And my biggest, I'm, I listen to bigger pockets the most, not saying that's the best or, you know, that they should go and listen to it. Um, but there are a lot of really good investment podcasts out there that, we're able to, you know, guys who have made it get on there and you're able to hear their secrets, their success stories, how they did it, and then take pieces of knowledge, you know, from multiple sources and be able to use that and um, to try it out yourself. And so one thing that I was, you know, terrified of was once I started kind of hearing all these things, I was overwhelmed by the knowledge and a lot of people um, get analysis paralysis and that's when, you know, you hear all this information, you spent all this time, you know, learning, reading books um, and then get so overwhelmed, you just don't do anything. And so that's a big thing is to make sure, you know, you're able to get the information you need to take a step forward. But you don't have to know all the information for every step of the way just to be able to pull the trigger on something. And so, I mean, I had moved into my very first house and, you know, started renting to these two guys. You know, I didn't have a lease. I didn't have, you know, anything in place. I was just like, Hey, you want to come live with me? You know, pay me 400 bucks yeah. a month. Venmo me. Yeah. Venmo me, you know, no business bank account, nothing, no CPA, um, no lawyer, any of that stuff. And so I'm, I'm not saying whatsoever, you know, don't have any of that stuff. It's just, I didn't have everything in place. And, you know, I'm still here today. And so um, you don't have to know every step, but it's good to go ahead and educate yourself on, you know, a good bit of it and see if that's something that you would be passionate, interested in. And, you know, it's something that can get you to that goal. Like one of my goals is financial freedom. It can get you there, you know, and it doesn't have to be real estate. It can be a business opportunity. It can be, um, you know, you work in a nine to five if that's the way that you want to do that. But you're also going to have to, invest in something else. And so it can be stocks, business, real estate. It's just the, the big path I take is, is real estate investing and, in, and in multifamily rentals. Yeah. That's good advice. So where, where did you go after the mobile home park? What was next? Yeah. So uh, after that mobile home port park, we uh, touched on earlier, you know, was fixing up the quadplex, trying to get it ready to rock and roll to take it to Mr. Banker. And that's what we did. So about six months passed, 
you know, I've got it all finished up. We have all new tenants, fresh paint, you know, everything's good to go. Um, and I go to Mr. Banker and I say, Hey, you know, I'm looking to get rid of this, um, or looking to, you know, get rid of owner financing deal and wanting to take it to a mortgage. And he was able, or we started moving the paperwork and, um, they were able to appraise it right at $400,000. And so I, I purchased this um, for around 175 <laughs> and so they, you know, wrote me a check for $300,000 and was able to pay off the 175 and then take that, you know, difference and start searching for new properties. And so that period took some time because I was between the refinance and the trailer part. I was starting full-time in construction, run my construction crews and was left my nine to five at that point. And so I didn't have any type of, um, you know, W2 income in order for me to get pre-approved for a loan or get a conventional loan. And so the banker that I went to does loans strictly on the property. So they're called um, non QRM loans where they come in and they evaluate the property, you know, do a debt to income ratio on it and then give the loan solely based on the property, not solely based on, you know, my income. And so it works, you know, strictly for investment properties. It's not something that you can kind of live in one or live in the property um, because then it wouldn't be generating that income. And so he was able to do that and that took some time. Um, but once, you know, I got that check, it was ready to rock and roll and, you know, keep busting out more units. Yeah. So, um, now you, you, you get a fourplex, you fix it up, you take it to the bank and you get a check for ooh, what, like 125,000 left over. Right around what, there. Yeah. What's, what's the move? You got six figures in the bank tax free. Yeah. Uh, you go buy a, <laughs> buy a sports car or. Yeah, so I went out and bought a Tesla and a uh, big butt. No, I'm just kidding. I absolutely didn't do a thing like that and I uh, wouldn't recommend it either because it's, you're still, you know, the tenants are paying, the rent's going to pay off that mortgage and that loan, but you're still taking that loan out um, when you do a cash out refinance. And so, you know, to take that money and sure, if you wanted to, you know, go buy a boat or whatnot, you could because the tenants would eventually pay that back. Um, but the smart thing to do is take it and use that to um, go in and, and purchase more rental properties. And so I was able, I found a duplex in um, Covington, Georgia, extremely nice. And so now I, I had my fun going after, you know, the, the older stuff that needed a lot of work. You know, I wanted something turnkey that was extremely nice and, you know, found something that was a little below retail, um, it wasn't a screaming deal. I mean, we were coming into, um, you know, a 2022 20, market that was, you know, prices were on the rise, interest rates were, were coming up. And so I was trying to make, you know, a safe investment and wasn't looking to, um, you know, something that I could probably keep 20 years from now. And so wanted to get into something really nice and, and sure enough, was able to find a duplex that the owner the builder of it actually lived in one side of the duplex and so built it extremely nice chandeliers, all um, hardwood floors throughout tile showers, walk-in showers, you know, Island on the, in the kitchen, um, just a beautiful, beautiful home. And so was able to take some of that cash out refinance money and purchase this. And so, you know, this one was, um, you know, through the same type of lender that's it's basing, this on the property, you know, basing the loan on the property instead of my income. And so he did require 20% down. And so 20% down, you know, we'll take a good chunk out of that, but was able to go ahead and pick up, you know, two more units. Nice. So wh where are you at now? Like what is a, a day in the life of Chris Petty and his business look like? Yeah. So right now we're at 15 units. Um, Six of those units, you know, like we talked about earlier, are 50-50. So I own 50% of those six units. The rest of them are 100% ownership. Um, I also own a construction business. And so they're able to do, you know, all of my 
maintenance requests. And so I keep property management in house solely because I have the maintenance guys that I, you know, do on another side of the business. So all I have to do is pick up a phone and say, Hey, go replace this mailbox, you know, go change out the toilet. It's, it's extremely easy when you have the guys at your fingertips, you know, and I'm paying them cost of labor costs and materials, you know, not having to pay a markup of, you know, hiring a handyman or, or even paying a 10% um, management fee to having all the properties management. And I also mm -hmm. use a uh, management software called Inago and uh, absolutely makes my life so easy. I can, um, you know, bring a tenant in, have them apply through there. They'll sign their lease through there. They um, deposit all of their money. And so I never have to meet my tenants face to face. You know, everything can be done electronically. They can submit maintenance requests, um, you know, the whole nine yards. And so, you know, currently I just purchased a house that I'm living in on around Athens, Georgia, and was able to, you know, hit that financial freedom mark and was able to take the last three and a half months off. You know, my, my wife and I are just kind of celebrating the new property and our dream home was able to get a puppy and uh, just taking it easy before we get ready to uh, start a new business venture. Yeah. Every time I call you, you're either in Mexico or like on the beach or about to go to Mexico or. <laughs> yeah. I or think, um, you know, That's a awesome. lot of, a lot of the time, you know, I see a bigger investors, um, people that are steps ahead of me. And I felt like they just kept going and going and going and never, you know, their goals at the very beginning, beginning was financial freedom. And then I'm like, well, now you're, you're obviously financially free, but you're still grinding, you know, 80 hours a week. And I just wanted to make sure that I was able to kind of stop and say, okay, you know, this was a huge goal that I was able to achieve in a short amount of time. You know, let's take some time for myself and my family and enjoy it before, you know, I, I go back full force and, and to starting something new and, you know, picking up more properties. And so, you know, the couple of things I've learned is it sounds really great, you know, to be sitting at home nine to five and not having, you know, too many <laughs> obligations, but um, you know, you, you have to have something to chase, you know, have to have something to do with your hands and, and keep moving. And so I think it's great to just be able to, you know, drop what I'm doing and, 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 focus on personal things whenever I need to, but I still think I'll always want to have um, something going on to where, you know, it needs my involvement, but still able to step away from it when I need to. Yeah. So what's next? Yeah, we're um, working on a plumbing business right now. And so I've actually put um, a hold on purchasing uh, real, I have one under contract now, but um, not actively looking um, for rentals at this second because of, um, you know, we have high interest rates, property values are extremely high. And so deals are out there. They're just a lot harder to, to pick up. You know, Tim, I know you're, you're in the process of picking one up right now. And so hmm. it's uh, definitely possible, you know, but with me taking the time off, um, we're working on stocking up some, some uh, funds and, and cash reserves. That way, you know, if there happened to be some type of downturn within the next couple of years, um, we're able to just uh, pick up a good amount of properties. And so, you know, one thing that I've always wanted to do is is build a business from the ground up. And the reason to build it from the ground up would be to, to build a business to sell. And so now I'm focusing on, you know, what's a huge need in, mm -hmm. in our community around here. Um, and, and plumbing is, is just catastrophic um, right now. You know, we don't have any guys that are, you know, coming out of high school and college that are going into this type of trade work. Um, you know, when I was working on um, the property that we live in now, um, you know, I don't do too much plumbing. And so I was looking for plumbers and it was the hardest thing in the world. And I was like, OK, well, I'm about to start that business. And so, you know, I plan to run it for two and two to two and a half years um, and kind of see what we can come up with and then turn around and, and, and sell it just to build it and to kind of see where we can go with it. So I don't know anything about plumbing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to find some, some uh, really great guys that I hope and that will be able to teach me everything that they know and bring them on, you know, and take really good care of them. And that's, you know, one thing that's treated me um, or gotten me to where I am is, is my guys in the contracting, you know, painting and flooring. 
I take very good care of them. I just sent them. Um, there's four of them, and I sent the four guys and their families to uh, St. George Island two weeks ago to go um, rented a huge monster beach house right on the beach. You know, I paid for it mm-hmm. all and let them take a vacation. And, you know, these guys, they are just super special to me. And um, it took so much work to kind of get to where we were um, operating, you know, with me out of the picture and they, um, they make my business what it is. And so I want to make sure I take really good care of them um, because it was tough finding those guys in the beginning too. You know, I would go through, 15 to 20 workers, um, you know, within a four or five months because of just the high turnover in this type of industry. So once I found these guys, I was able to, you know, pour into them. They poured into me, you know, again, you know, I'm not a painter. I don't install flooring, um, but that's the company that I own. And they were able to teach me how to do that and be able to, you know, provide them daily work, provide them, you know, the benefits that, that they get and just being able to, um, you know, work together and have that partnership. Yeah. That's huge. And like building the team is one of the most important parts in any business, not just real estate, but I, I, I wanted to, um, touch back on the plumbing company that you're, you're just starting it. And you mentioned that you're, you're building it to sell, which you're in an interesting position, you know, having these other businesses and the passive income, the real estate, is that every decision you're going to have to make with this plumbing company doesn't determine whether you eat next week or not. So it's like you, you can make the decisions uh, with, you know, five years in mind or selling the company in mind and stuff like that. So it doesn't necessarily um, have to feed you this week kind of thing, which, which a lot of businesses have to deal with. So I'm curious, like what, what are some of the moves that you're going to make since you're going to you know be, be in a different position than some people? Does yeah. that make sense? And that's, you know, the, when I started the handyman contracting business, um, it was solely to put food on the table Mm -hmm. and, you know, for me to survive. And so it was just a side gig. And so I could, you know, have that money to either invest or, and, um, you know, it, it paid the light bills. And so, you know, like you said, now that I have that financial freedom, um, going into this business, what, you know, once I leave, you know, this, four or five months of that I'm taking, I'm going to plan to, you know, travel and do conferences. Um, and there's, you know, to all types of conference all over the world for every industry that you can think of. And so, you know, before I ever send the first plumber out, I'm going to make sure that, you know, we're going very well prepared with all the latest software, you know, our bookkeeping is in intact. Our prices are, are standard across the board. You know, it's not that, he put a faucet in at one house that was a hundred bucks. And then he, you know, we quoted 400 at the next house, you know, it'll be pretty standard um, processes. And that way we can, you know, keep really good books and be able to, you know, show everything that we've accomplished over a two and a half year period or longer and um, have that opportunity to, you know, take that business and, and, um, and sell it to someone. And so I think, before we make a first move is to answer your question is just making sure I educate myself um, enough to take that first step. Mm. That's awesome. I'm uh, excited to see how that goes. (laughs) Yeah. Who knows? We're going to, we're going to try it out. Yeah. So uh, what, what advice would you give to someone that's um, starting out in real estate or, you know, they're just the the college student that thinks they want to get into real estate? Like what, what was the first move? Yeah. So, you know, you have to get over the fact of, uh, I didn't have a very high IQ. I still don't, um, you know, coming out of college, <laughs> I barely scraped by. And so you don't have to be a genius to, um, be able to achieve financial freedom. And whenever you realize that, you know, all of these guys that have, and, and, you know, not to rag on Tim, but you know, Tim didn't even graduate college and he's, he's beaten mm-hmm. the socks off of, everybody I know at his age. And so it's, um, it's not about whether you went to college or not. It's not about, you know, your IQ. It's just you putting in the effort and putting the effort in the right areas. And so, you know, if if you're deciding to move into real estate, um, plan six months of, of just education and then, you know, tell yourself at the end of that six months, 
there's going to be action taken or it can be shorter. It can be longer. Um, just make sure, you know, you write out a timeline of this is going to be what, how would I allow myself to spend educating and listen to podcasts and reading books and meeting with investors and going to conferences. But at this point, you know, I'm going to make a decision and make something happen um, and achieve one of these goals that I set at the beginning of this. And so, because it's, you know, I think fear is, is big. And that was my biggest thing. It's like, I'm not smart enough to, you know, run rental properties or get a rental property, but you really don't have to be, you just have to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Great. And what's a book that you've either given away or recommended the most other than rich dad, poor dad. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, there's a guy out there, Hayden Crabtree. He's our age. Um, he is absolutely incredible and dominates the storage industry of self-storage. Uh, he started out with um, rental properties the same way that you and I did. And um, he wrote a book called Skip the Flip. And it teaches you, you know, why it's important to not be so concerned with, you know, flipping a property and having that cash immediately. It's more concerned on being able to have investments because you can, you can flip and flip and flip and make this money but the day that you quit flipping is the day the money stops coming in. And so that's not an investment. You know, it's, it may work out in, in someone's game plan to flip a couple at the beginning and, and use that money to fund long-term investments, but a long-term investment or something that will bring in, you know, get you financially free is having that cash flow come in monthly. Um, and, and he has touches on so many topics and just, allows you to kind of wrap your head around and, and it ties in a little bit to rich that poor dad too, of just being able to understand, you know, good and bad debt and what it takes to get financial freedom. Gotcha. And what is one of the greatest lessons you've learned in the last 12 months? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I would say just being, you know, omnipresent is, is really big. And so that's something that I'm, working on now and struggling with is trying to build, you know, a, a brand because your brand is your most important thing. Um, and, and being a, you know, as young as we are, I mean, we utilize all of the social medias um, and we have opportunities on there that we can take the time and, you know, show others, you know, some of the things that we know, and, you know, one thing that I would want to focus more on, and you know, something that I've learned and still learning is being able to build a bigger brand um, because it's a lot of the guys out there, you know, it's say and, and, and definitely believe that your brand is the biggest thing that you have. Um, and so you're able to utilize uh, a lot of relationships and people will be able to learn from you and then you can turn around and learn from them at the same time. Yeah. Your brand is like what people think and say about you when you're not there. That's kind Absolutely. of like your reputation. Your brand is your reputation, but it's more of a, uh, from a marketing perspective. So is there, is there any last thing like you wanted to touch on or, uh, another point you wanted to drive home before we wrap it up? Like just, just that you just need people to know. I know you've, you've gone into pretty good detail, but I just want to make sure there's nothing else uh, that we could squeeze out of you. Yeah. I would say, um, you know, one thing that I didn't touch on is like, um, you know, there's a difference between good and bad debt. And this is something that I struggled with a lot at the beginning. And so, you know, I grew up in a household that you need to pay off everything uh, eventually. And so you need to have a car, no car payment, no home payment. Um, you know, pay everything down to zero. And, and that is, um, you know, what my parents live by, you know, my grandparents live by. And so, you know, but with an investing world, you know, it may not be a great idea, you know, if you have cash to take that cash to a car dealership and pay $30,000 for a car, when what you could have done is take, um, you know, go to a bank and get a two or 3% loan on that vehicle you know, put a thousand or two down, have a five or six year loan on it, and then take that $30,000 cash you had and put it in to, you know, $120,000 or some type of investment to where you can get 
an eight, 10, even 20% return on cash on cash um, and leverage that debt because, you know, and that's what's so great about real estate is you can come in, you know, if you have $30,000 and you go to the stock market, I mean, you can buy $30,000 worth of stock, maybe a little bit of more with margin. But if you have $30,000 in real estate, you can buy a $150,000 home. And in, in real mm-hmm. estate, you know, you're going to generate that cash flow, which is the cash on cash return. But what you're also generating that's kind of it's unrealized is you're appreciating on that property. So in a, over a 10 year period, you're seeing a you know, three to five percent return on that property going up in value that you'll eventually either pull out from selling or doing a cash out on it. And then you're also getting a lot, if not all of that income tax free because the government wants you to provide affordable housing. So they come in and give you all of these tax benefits and allows you to depreciate the properties and, you know, gives you just these slots where they want you to go. And so you put your money there and invest there. You, they're going to give you a lot of breaks for it. Um, and so, and you also have the tenants paying down your debt as well. And so it's kind of a win, win, win. And so, it was really hard for me to understand not to try to put as much money down on a car and pay it off as absolutely fast as I could, you know, cause I'm just avoiding one or 2% return or one or 2% of interest over here. But instead, you know, if I just paid it off the <coughs> minimum I had to, and then take that money and invest it in other places, you're going to see a lot bigger return and you'll reach your goals a lot faster. Yeah. You, you touched on an important part with the leverage when you're saying you can buy a $150,000 asset with $30,000 and then that home increases from one hundred fifty to two hundred. dollars Well, now you have $80,000 in equity and you only put 30000 in. So you more than doubled your money just by uh, using the leverage in the property, which is something you can't really do with stocks. So that's, that's one of the many ways you make money in real estate, but I kind of wanted to bring that part out just because it's it's pretty powerful like you more than double your money just by you know the um property increasing by 20 25 percent yeah that's right and i mean you can do the same thing i did you can go in and you know find a property get it on our finance find a partner you know go into it with no money and then have a little bit of money on the side where you can fix it up improve the property make it worth a lot more get higher rents on it um and so there's a lot that you can do just by not having that car paid off as fast as, you know, you possibly can. And so getting over that mindset was tough at the beginning, but once I was actually able to see it happen in firsthand and see, you know, other investors, you know, share their stories about it, I was able to overcome it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I think I made a video about this when I did make a video. I know I did with the, the debt, like you were saying, paying off the car, paying off the student loans. And it's at like, you know, three to 5% interest rate when you could just put in real estate, make 15, 20, 25%, and then just let that cash flow pay off the debt. So it's uh, a, there, there's a lot of different mindset that goes into it and kind of comes from how you were raised and how you grew up to treat debt. But it's like, it's a tool as a financial tool. And then it's one of the, the most powerful ones in real estate. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Tim, for having me. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on and we'll, uh, we'll end it there. Thanks.